Welcome again to another chapter and podcast of Cosmic Careers with your hosts, Veronica Chiaravalli and myself, Alistair Brown. Welcome. This week, we will be talking about going to work in near-Earth space. There will be a massive amount of job opportunities in space, and companies, universities, and space agencies will take advantage of all this. The companies will range in size from 10 people to thousands, and research and development, which will come first, will span disciplines such as horticulture, medicine, mining, and space manufacturing, beginning with small parts like components for communications and space vehicles, but will quickly and greatly expand. We will cover two different subjects, space medicine and space mining. These are important because space medicine and space medical technology will be a major import to Earth from space, and so will precious metals from the moon and asteroids. They are very different, yet somehow they will go together. The field of medicine in space cannot occur without the means to go into space because the research required in making not only zero-gravity medicines but other forms of medical treatment such as protein-based implants, stem cell tissues, and tissue chips. You will have to explain each one individually. Start with the implants. I understand that they are special implants for the eye. Protein-based retinal implants made in zero gravity increases the stability, activity, and optical quality accelerating protection. Because of the improvement of the quality of the implants due to zero gravity and an ultra-clean environment that goes with it, these implants can help patients blinded by retinal degenerative diseases reduce their blindness and possibly eliminate it altogether. And that's just the beginning. Remember, zero gravity allows for more purity and less defects. Stem cells have been controversial in the States since the beginning of the century, but they have special qualities that can imitate almost any cell in the human body. Stem cell tissue engineering is the ability of these cells to differentiate into different specialized cell types producing whatever cells are required to treat certain diseases. Explain tissue chip research. In tissue chip research, chips are artificially grown bits that mimic the function of an organ, providing enormous implications for disease control. If I may dare say it, this could lead to the regeneration of body parts like regrowing a missing arm or a leg. Different space companies have also collaborated on lung chips, blood-brain barrier chips, and brain organoids. These are analogs for actual brains, miniature organs artificially grown that resemble the brain. Can you imagine repairing damaged brain tissue? To where will this lead? Perhaps curing humans with Down's syndrome? You never know. What about cancer? Cancer tissues have also been experimented on with drugs applied to binding both antibodies and cancerous cells. We can now produce a 3D image of the cancerous tumor so that the antibodies can bind to the cancerous cells and can be treated. This could lead to medical discoveries we can't even imagine right now. One problem humans cannot escape are the effects of near-zero gravity on the human body itself. It has been proven that bones can deteriorate in space and the astronaut will need to exercise two hours a day in addition to taking bone treating drugs. Astronauts in space can lose around 1.2% bone mass in a month where it would normally take a year. In order to slow this, they have to exercise for two hours a day, like you said, and take certain drugs that would inhibit bone degeneration. These would be drugs normally treating osteoporosis. If humans are to migrate and work in space for long periods of time, drugs will be needed to develop in order for humans to live long periods in space, like decades, or the human body needs to evolve. Another way of working against this is to have 
artificial gravity in their space habitats and do heavy work in space, which is what they would do anyway, like construction and moving heavy components. Now we come to another major aspect of space, mining asteroids. It was in the early 2000s that many entrepreneurs turned their eyes towards mining asteroids. Different resources were known to exist on these asteroids, and an institution like the Colorado School of Mines did experiment with rocks and minerals of similar composition, extracting oxygen attached to these minerals, and then extract the minerals themselves, preparing for a future mineral rush similar to gold rushes of the 19th century. Most of these resources, when mined, will mostly be used in space applications rather than on Earth because of the needs of the space settlers and manufacturers. This is called ISRU, in situ resource utilization, meaning literally living off the land. The minerals will be processed and then used for building the infrastructure along with space habitats, space vehicles, computers, anything that is needed in space rather than to bring these tools and construction materials from Earth, saving launch costs and energy, meaning a lot of money would be saved. Whoever would be manufacturing space-made products would be making a profit and the space movement would pay for itself. The first element that will be extracted from these asteroids, however, will be water in the form of ice. This means fuel for spaceships. The water would pass through electricity, known as the electrolysis, and split into liquid hydrogen and oxygen. These would fuel the ships and power them by mixing these two elements, producing thrust with water as a byproduct. The two elements would also be used for way stations and refueling stations for other spaceships. Water, of course, would also be used for drinking and growing crops and everything else requiring the use of it, but it will have to be conserved from the very beginning, no matter how much we find, because we don't want to run out. Alternatives to water will have to be used in other functions. Many countries and individuals have their eyes on near-Earth asteroids, including Russia, China, Japan, South Korea, and Europe, as well as the United States. Luxembourg has positioned itself to be a corporate base for space business. Planetary Resources, a small company formed with an interest in extracting water for use in space, but it was later acquired by Consensus in 2018 and changed their focus to space initiative. Another company, Deep Space Industries, was also proposed but was acquired by Bradford Space, a company that centers around space satellites and components for spacecraft. This isn't a bad thing. Although these two companies didn't make it, future companies will. They just need to be in the right place at the right time. The process of mining these asteroids will require three stages. The first is identifying these resources. This means analyzing the asteroid and seeing what elements of which they are composed for mining. What is to be mined depends on what will be needed. Water will always be needed, so asteroids composed of ice will always be a target. You mustn't forget space debris. All kinds of space debris, from pellet-sized debris in low Earth orbit, to spent satellites, to expended rocket stage in higher orbits. Cleaning the Earth's orbit of space junk can yield valuable minerals and metals to help build the space infrastructure. This would be the first space recycling. This also means big money. What would the second stage in mining asteroids? The second stage would be to develop the technology to extract asteroidal resources. Asteroids have such low gravity that just hitting them with a pick or a skip loader would just propel the chunks of rock into space. Same as if a human jumped from an asteroid he or she would propel into space. So how would we mine them if we can't do it the old-fashioned way? With pick and shovel? Types of robotic, and it has to be robotic, mining systems will have to be invented. 
there will still be humans managing these robotic workforce. For extracting water, the process will involve intense light and heat. A reflector would direct solar energy onto the rock. The sun heats the rock. The rock releases the water. The rock from the pressure of the steam itself expands and breaks apart. The water and other elements are frozen and caught by mass catchers, which have not yet been invented but are on the drawing board. The third phase is large-scale production of products made from these minerals, fully commercialized and making a profit. 3D printers can be used to manufacture these products after the minerals are processed to build anything that is needed in space. Tools, spare parts, even habitats. Mining and manufacturing can take place in one spot, it seems. One cannot and should not move an asteroid near the Earth for fear that if it was moved in the wrong place, it could get out of control and hit the Earth, resulting in a disaster. Then where would be an ideal place to put them? 60 degrees from the moon in either direction. This means if you draw a line from Earth to the moon and draw another line 60 degrees to the right of it, then another 60 degrees to the left of it, you would have an ideal place for an asteroid. This is where the gravities of both the Earth and the moon cancel each other out, producing a stable orbit. These are known as L4 and L5, two of the five Lagrange libration points. These two are the most stable of orbits. The other points are L3, 180 degrees from the Earth-Moon point, and L1 and L2 at opposite ends from the Moon, both about 61 kilometers from the lunar surface, but in the Earth-Moon line. These aren't as stable. Here is an example. Picture an asteroid about to hit the Earth and destroy it. People panic, but there are some very smart entrepreneurs that could mine it, and they do. As it approaches the Earth, it grows smaller, and the entrepreneurs grow richer and richer until no more asteroid. Disaster is averted on the side. Now, if you could draw a two-panel cartoon with this, the first panel would have an asteroid in the sky with people on the ground panicking. The second panel would have that very same asteroid in the sky in the exact same location, but with a dollar sign on it, and people below looking at it with a sense of getting rich, I hate to say greed. A lot of money is about to come in, and I hope someone who was listening to this podcast can draw this cartoon I've just described. I'm no artist. Note that the Chinese character for crisis is the exact same character for opportunity. It depends on how you look at it. Anyway, you can see the mining opportunities in producing mining equipment, towing the asteroids to stable orbits, mining the asteroids, producing products from 3D printing. And this is just the surface of space manufacturing and salvaging space junk for their resources. There is an anecdote about two brothers who do just that. Tell us. Uh, no, I don't think so. If you want to know the story, you have to go out and buy the book and read it yourself. You know how to obtain a copy, and I'll let you in on something. The book has two anecdotes, both of which I've written. So get your copy of Cosmic Careers on the net or in your local bookstore and read the anecdotes along with the rest of the book. Next week, we will devote a whole chapter on constructing habitats so you'll have somewhere to live in space or on the moon. We are looking forward to that, so join us next week. Bye. Bye.